Roll for Crit is made possible thanks to the support of viewers like you and our patrons on our Patreon page. You can become a patron for just $1 a month at patreon.com slash roll for crit. Hey there, by the time you're watching this, election night has passed, but we have recorded before then, so we do not know any of the results. Either way, I'm sure things are tense, so hopefully these Kickstarter Pickstarters can help distract you for the week of November 2nd, 2020. Feed the Kraken is a social deduction game from Fun Tales, people who brought you Glenmore Chronicles and Glenmore Chronicles 2. Uh, this one takes place on a pirate ship, and it's a hit and roll social deduction strategy game. Everybody is part of a different team. There are three teams. You could either be a pirate, a sailor, or a cultist. And your end goal is to uh, try to get to one of three different locations, depending on which of those groups you are a part of. And as the game goes on, you're going to be navigating. Uh, someone will be elected as the captain. There will also be a navigator. And they will be choosing cards uh, and secretly adding them to a box. And some of those cards will be discarded. So there's an element of randomness, an element of not knowing necessarily who put what cards in at which times. And that will determine which direction the ship moves in. And you're going to try be trying to argue why you had to choose where you wanted to go, which part of the team that you're on, etc. Only the pirates will know who each other are. Everyone else is going to be in the dark. Uh, there are also going to be mutinies in this one, so potentially you could try to overthrow the captain and become the new captain yourself if you don't trust them. And then there are also, are also some spaces with krakens on them, and you can actually feed someone to the kraken, and if that happens, that player is eliminated from the game. As soon as you reach one of those three destinations, the game ends, and everybody who was part of that team, whether they got fed to the kraken or not, uh, will have survived. Well, not survived, but they will have won the game. <laughs> they, hopefully they survived. It depends on how things go. So, you know, social deduction, this checks a lot of the boxes that I'm into. There are a lot of quotes on this page, high praise quotes from different outlets that maybe are a little hyperbolic, I feel, that are like, this is the best social deduction game ever made, that kind of thing. Uh, it remains to be seen. I don't know if it's going to be quite that incredible, but I do, I love the idea of, I love social deduction games where there's more than just two teams, adds a little bit of extra stuff, so it's not so clear cut who is who. I was actually going to say, this reminds me a lot of Tortuga, uh, I forget the year attached to it. Yeah, another social deduction pirate game. I don't but remember the year either. <laughs> not just because it's pirates, but there were multiple teams. So you actually had to, it wasn't simply just red team, blue team. There was like like the French versus the English versus I think the Dutch or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that does really uh, switch things up because it, and it's not simply the like, like I'm trying to think of I've seen a couple games that sort of do that but I don't think it counts sort of like when there's like the Cylon it's not you're not the Cylon but you're like the Cylon sympathist I think is the card or something S Cylon leader or sympathizer there's different right. variants in Battlestar Galactica you're yeah. like sort of on one team or another mm -hmm. yeah it's, a, it's an interesting more interesting dynamic I think uh, yeah so I think having that extra team though it's I'm very curious how do you how since you can see the board how do you argue like Literally, you're going to the cultist space. Look, I'm not a cultist. I just really thought that was the best way to go. Well, the way there will be some stuff on the board you might want to avoid, but also the way it's laid out is, I think, is smart because it's not just, it's not like, oh, this is the path that clearly goes all the way towards the end. The board is more of like a round kind of a shape. So, and all three spaces are at one side of it. So by the time you get that close to any of them, probably your allegiances are starting to show anyway. Uh, so your allegiance is showing. Yeah, that's yeah. So I think that that uh, is cool, and it's a big, interesting board with a lot of cool minis, very deluxe kind of presentation to it. Uh, you can get a basic version of the game. There's a deluxe version at a higher price. The basic one is around fifty six dollars if you want to back it, and it's called Feed the Kraken. Sticking with the sea theme, we're now going to go to an expansion for the game Atlantis Rising. Atlantis Rising released a little while back and was on actually on my list of biggest regrets. This is a cooperative game when the gods have been angered by Atlantis and they're sinking it. So it's up to you to place your workers to go out on each arm of Atlantis, try to gather resources in order to build your escape before the entire city floods. Now they've actually added some monsters. 
Technically, this was hinted at with a print and play earlier, but now this is an official boxed expansion with plenty of meeples and cards titled Atlantis Rising Monstrosities. The gods now are ang just as angry as ever, and they've sent some monsters to try and help end your demise even faster. You have classic monsters such as Medusa, who will paralyze your meeples and turn them to stone, as well as harpies, which are very annoying and will be stealing resources and flying to their own little island. You can try to combat these creatures. Of course, they'll be very difficult to deal with. However, some of them can be turned into allies because they don't like the gods that much either, if you're willing to pay. So this expansion not only adds new difficulties for you in terms of like these monsters that will change up how you're able to deal with all these resources and of course what chaos is on your way, but also more advantages for you in both the allies and actually some bonuses for the lower player counts in order to help balance and make things a little bit easier on that end. I mean, like I said, this game, one of the reasons I chose this one is this was one of my biggest regrets of not having the chance to play back when it came out. And uh, seeing this expansion too with monsters, which are the kind of things I love, only makes me want it even more. Yeah, I, I wish I could, you know, add something about, yeah, it's really great. But yeah, neither of us have had the chance to play the original one. Uh, it's it's obviously gotten plenty of acclaim. And yeah, this sounds almost, you know, makes me think of Cyclades, the way you could kind of take control of different mythical beasts and uh, to some extent, at least for a period of time and maybe use them to your advantage in different ways. I like that sort of concept of, you know, having larger than life monsters in the mix. I mean, this Atlantis is part of the classic Greek-Roman mythology, so it only seems to make sense they're going to see creatures like Medusa come in. Though it is nice that they actually have a role to be ally or enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were lucky enough to already have the game, the expansion is just $29. But of course, if you missed out like I did, you can get the core game or even some more deluxe goodies. Star Scrappers Orbital is from Hexi Studio. It's another in their Star Scrappers series, but this is a standalone title designed by the same guy who made Terraforming Mars. Uh, in this one, everyone is managing their own orbital space station uh, with plenty of different modules. And as you play, you will be gaining new modules that you can purchase and attaching them in different configurations as part of your own station. Now, each one of those modules has its own unique power that you can activate unless they are damaged, in which case you'll have to repair them. And everything is all about, of course, getting money, credits. Uh, all of your actions will cost different amounts depending on what you want to purchase and how you want to uh, use some of your actions and abilities. And you'll ultimately be rewarded uh, at the end of each year. It takes place over five years, which is each round, uh, by getting points for how many of each color that you have. So whoever has the most of a certain color module will be awarded with points. So you're competing with other players on that front, and you have to figure out, are you going to go in on specific colors or go for different ones than everyone else or try to get an even spread. And obviously some of those modules themselves will have different ways to get you points uh, towards the end. So kind of a similar, uh, in a broad sense, idea to Terraforming Mars in that you're all corporations and it's all about getting money. It also carries over the thing of each player doing an action and going around until everybody uh, has passed for that round, uh, which I, I enjoyed in, uh, in Terraforming Mars as well. And I just really like the the look of the modules because uh, they all have, they're not, they're not like puzzle pieces, they don't fit into place, but you do have to align them and make sure they match up in certain ways. And you get to design this interesting little configuration that will be unique to you probably every single game. Yeah, I looked at this one too, and I love that the matching up, like you can see like the, the ports need to make sense because you got to be able to walk there. Also, like you said, I really hope this has that same feeling of Terraform Mars. One of the reasons I love that game is I feel like the engine building is really solid. It's really fun when you make your engine work in those ways, and it feels a little, just a bit more satisfying compared to others, and I hope that game captures that feeling too. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too. So if you are hopeful and you want to try out uh, Scrapper's Orbital, Star Scrapper's Orbital, I should say, uh, then you can back this one. It goes for $38. My next game is called Rochambeau. No, I'm not technically talking about the game that you play on the playgrounds where you simply play rock, paper, scissors. This is a game, though, based on those mechanics. The idea behind this is you have your own little units, miniatures, that are of rock, 
paper, and scissors. You will move them around the board and try to compete against your opponents. When you come up against the opponent, you roll dice, and if you have the advantage, you get more dice. So it's not a guaranteed win that rock beats scissors, but it's pretty likely. Of course, there's more to it than that in order to make this a pick. Throughout the game, artifacts are going to be placed on the board. When you move your piece onto one, you will draw two cards from the artifact deck. You will get to choose one of these for yourself, but you have to give the other to your opponent. What's important about this is you now have the advantage knowing, like, I gave him a card that allows him to make scissors move two more spaces, for example. So you can plan around that, and they don't know what you have. These cards can be one-time effects or passive abilities that affect certain ty- your certain kind of units. So you can make something a little bit stronger or can move it a little bit farther. And it's weirdly, after reading all this, like, yeah, that all makes sense. This seems like really fun. It's not simply just adding rock, paper, scissors, mechanic to games. I've seen games where it's like, this is a fire type. Fire beats water. Water beats grass. So on and so forth. That's it. It's not a guarantee. You still roll the dice. And then with those artifacts, you can change things up. It's like, now guess what? My... My rock moves like a rook from chess, so this is going to be really crazy how that's running around the field. (laughs) And, of course, depending on what cards you draw from the artifact can really change up how the game flow of that game plays. This one caught my eye as well. I mean, just on the surface, it's uh, very cute and funny, the idea of the actual hands going around in their different positions. Uh, And, like you said, it's it's not just, oh, rock beats... What does it beat against scissors? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit more to it. So, uh, not, but not so much more that I think like it's still simple enough that, you know, it, people who are just interested in the idea of rock, paper, scissors, this is like maybe the next level. It takes it to a different place. It is a little, the title, I feel like, I wish it was called like Rochambeau colon something. Cause it just, it, like, that is the name of a game already. <laughs> Especially had something else on there. But that's my only nitpick. Otherwise, I think it looks pretty fun. And in addition, if you watch the video, one of the creators is wearing a twerp shirt, so you know they also got good taste in music as well. If you're looking to get this game, it starts at $32, and once again, this is not your regular Rochambeau. This is Rochambeau the board game. Xeno Language is a role-playing game from Thorny Games with a really interesting sci-fi concept similar to stories like the recent movie Arrival. Maybe that's not recent anymore. It's like two years old, but (laughs) seems recent to me. You are all a group of players trying to uh, have first contact with aliens that have contacted Earth, but you have to decipher their language, figure out what they want. Now, this is a role-playing game, but it has a board with tokens, and those tokens have different alien symbols on them. They're going to have be randomized each time that you play. And there's almost a Ouija board type of element where players will be moving a piece around the board to those symbols to determine how you communicate with the aliens exactly. And underneath those symbols are going to be little prompts. And you, throughout the game, your characters will be deciding what are your relationships to each other? Or what do these symbols mean to you? Uh, you're going to like flash back to different moments from your life and ultimately determine what this says about what the aliens are trying to say and what the best way is to approach conversation with them based on who you are as a, as a player, as a character. So a lot of weird cerebral heady stuff going on there. Uh, but it's it sounds like the kind of thing where you can really kind of get in touch with your character's feelings, if not your real feelings, and f- find a way to discuss uh, different sorts of aspects of life and culture and language that most RPGs aren't really looking at. Now, there is no GM in this one, and there's no there's no player playing as the aliens, so it really is a group effort. It's up to you as the players to decide uh, how they respond to things and what that means. I don't know. I feel like these aliens are all just going to end up being like, would you be willing to switch your car insurance? <laughs> that, was there an alien Geico commercial or is that just the? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking like generic spam, you know? Oh, all right. Yeah. I mean, that they could, I don't know if you're playing, then I guess maybe that will happen. <laughs> There's a chance. Uh, it, it's up to you. You could, or you could take it as deep as you want. Uh, it's, it's a really cool idea. They've done a couple other projects, this company that similarly explore uh, elements of language and things like that. If you want to try out Xeno language, it's $55 for that base edition. Also includes uh, access to a tabletop simulator version, so you can still get that board experience if you're playing remotely. Weirdly enough, we're circling around to our first pick with this last one, which is the art of board games. 
This is a collection based on the art and the experiences from James Churchill. And the idea behind this is it's obviously, like I said, he's worked as a freelancer in a lot of different games. The cover itself is of our first Kickstarter pick. Uh, and, but it's not simply just the art. It also explains like shows pictures of like when people have said, all right, we're looking for art that looks like a pirate ship moving in the sea. And then he'll explain how he made the process of making the pieces of art you know, of adding different things or even talking with the publishers to include certain kinds of details, which I actually think is mu mu almost more interesting than simply the final piece. It's sort of that behind the scenes of like, why is this car? Why did you decide to have someone holding a spear this way? And it's like, well, we're trying to show this piece off a little more. And I think if you're interested in anything like that, or you like beautiful pieces of art, this is a book to take a look at. You know, uh, I think that we're slowly growing. I think we've had a couple book Kickstarters on here before, but usually it's more about like the game designers, not usually the artists themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's a. Anytime there's this kind of like behind the scenes look or uh, art books, I've seen a couple like sp art books specifically for the games they were attached to. It's interesting mm -hmm. to see. You know, this one has obviously multiple games, uh, so I, I think it's cool. And I, and I like the look of uh, James Churchill's art as well. I, I mean, I will. I will give this one another. <laughs> I feel like it's a similar title critique to Rochambeau, where I did when I first see this think, oh, the art of board games. Well, it's the art of board games by this one guy. <laughs> I feel like the title paints a picture of like well, I guess more would, stuff. <laughs> right, but I feel like it's the same thing. You'd be like, uh, cookable by Alton Brown, author, Alton Brown. Wait, what? You know? <laughs> like, because his, he's the author, so his name's on the cover still. Right. I just wish it was like the art of James Churchill's board games right. or something. I don't know. I just Because I would love to see a book that covered like a lot of other board games from different artists too. I think that would no, be cool. I mean that you we want we just need more of both. I think I think having a yeah. focus on artists. This like is you have purely a, a title criticism. But it would also be cool, especially if you take something like, for example, Magic the Gathering, which you know has a lot of art to deal with. So to hear from all the different artists would be very cool in their situation of like dealing with, uh, in particular with Magic, once again, where they become more picky with their artist. That's yeah. actually the thing I'd love to hear is just how picky certain game designers are with their art versus being like, eh, draw me a barbarian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you could explore there. If you want to take a look at James Churchill's work and see some of his experiences while making art in the board game industry, you can buy this book hardcover for $22 right now. Those are not the only Kickstarters up this week. No, no, no. We also have a separate preview video for Pachacuna, which is a llama-themed game where two players are going around a board trying to collect different resources and you're rotating tiles. Some very unique mechanisms in that one that I think are worth taking a look at. I also wanted to shout out there are, is a new Kickstarter for some expansions for Escape the Dark Sector which is a co-op retro kind of dice rolling adventure game that we reviewed uh, the base for not too long ago. I just wanted to highlight, I, I wanted to highlight some of the more, you know, original games that I saw, but I, I do enjoy that game system. And there's a lot more content in that. If you like that uh, system from playing it the first hey, time, nothing wrong with that, especially since we already did a review. So you can just hop on over there. If you'd like those to see, if you'd like those core mechanics, that's right. There you go. <laughs> uh, let us know in the comments, what you think? Which ones are you backing? And uh, will you be, are, are you in a good mood today or are you in a bad mood today when you're backing these Kickstarters? Uh, or maybe we don't even know what kind of mood we're in. Who knows what state the world is in right now? Uh, but talk to us, let us know which of these games are you putting your money towards. Until then, I'm Will. I'm Jonathan. And this has been Kickstarter Pickstarter. Catch the latest from Roll for Crit by liking and subscribing, and don't forget to support us on Patreon. Don't get analysis paralysis, just click those buttons, help us out!